sorry I'm late. Stuck behind a bunch of trucks. Uh, okay, this was the um, from the uh, exam, the last question from the exam on the long range order, where we have the silver copper at the, uh, so I said at the room temperature, all the silver are on the silver side, or at zero Kelvin, all the silver on the silver sites, all the copper on the copper sites. So you have an ordered material with the cesium fluoride structure. Then as you start to heat it up, some of the copper goes over here, some of the silver goes over here, and it gets more and more disordered until at a finite temperature of around 600 Kelvin, you reach an order-disorder transformation at which all the silver, the silver and copper are randomly distributed over both sites. In that case, the cesium fluoride symmetry is lost. It simply becomes a body-centered cubic disordered material. So this is an order-disorder order disorder transformation for long range order, a long range order disorder transformation. And I showed with a very simple model, which I qualitatively, it's quite easy to explain, a lot of talk about later, quantitatively to optimize long range order is much more comp the order disorder transformation is much more complicated. But in short range order, um, the long range order order disorder transformation at least understood this way in the simple Ising model is quite simple. So if you look at that as a reciprocal system, here you have AB, here you have BA, which is exactly the same thing as AB. There's no difference between the two sites. Here you would have AA and BB. And you actually get a miscibility gap along here. If you look at this as a reciprocal system, you're getting a miscibility gap. This is your disordered region. And this would be your ordered region along here as you're going to the entire system. So if we were looking, what would happen now if we were to take a system AB versus temperature? Uh, the AB, so if you were on the AB join here, in this particular question we were at 50-50. So we were at 50-50, so actually the, consider the system, the system A is copper, whatever you want, B is silver. You have lines on here of constant overall mole fraction. Your lines of constant overall mole fraction go this way. This would be pure A, this would be overall mole fraction of A to B in the binary system. You're moving across like this. Okay, so what you're doing here, if you started over uh, at pure A, you would move along here, then you could move along the miscibility gap like this. This would be disordered. Uh, this is T equals constant. You move, if you started with pure A and you moved across at constant temperature, this would be a disordered region. Then you would move into an ordered region. Okay. Around like <coughs> this. And then you'd go back into a disordered region again over here as you moved across the system. Or you could consider that you're just going straight across here. You're going to a, a disordered region, then you're crossing the ordered region where you have the ordered phases. You could consider you have two ordered phases, AB and BA, in equilibrium if you like, but they're identical. So it's either the same thing and then you come out this end. As a result, you're going to get, as you move across here, you're going to get a disordered region, a disordered region, and then in the center you'll cross an ordered region as you go across. So this would be your critical temperature at exactly 50%. That's what you've calculated here. And then as you add more B or you add more A, you lower this order-disorder transformation temperature. So you actually have here a curve like this, which is a second-order phase transformation line. <coughs> a second-order phase transformation line for the order-disorder transformation, which has its maximum at the AB composition and then decreases on either side. Or in other words, adding, or the other way of looking is it adding, adding, extra, adding extra B or extra A favors the disorder, okay, which makes sense as well, right, the AB, the highest order, the ordering is because the AB bonds are strong relative to AA and BB bonds, AB bonds are preferred, okay, the silver-copper bonds are stronger than the copper-copper-silver-silver bonds, okay, that's why you get disordering, the entropy, of course, destroys it as you go to higher temperature, but now if you went sideways here, you added more, more B or more A, then you're just adding more B, more A, you're decreasing the number of AB bonds, per mole of substance, so you're stabilizing the disordered state, you're destabilizing the ordered state. So your second order phase transformation would tend to have a maximum at the point where you have a maximum maximum number of AB bonds. Looking at it in the reciprocal case, you must have 
probably the best way of looking at it is this, you're moving across here. You can be anywhere in the system, but the number of, you have to be on this line by symmetry in this case. It's nothing to do with charge neutrality. Just BA and AB are identical. This is a mirror line. This side of this reciprocal system is exactly the same as this side. Okay, so by symmetry, uh, you remain here. So if you start off pure A over here, then you move through a disordered region up to here. Then you move through a two-phase ordered region, but the two phases are identical. Okay, so you, so this is your two-phase ordered region, if you like, or a one-phase ordered region, however you want to look at it. Then when you reach this point over here, now you move back. You now you're moving back into the disordered region. So you're going to get an order-disorder transformation line that looks something like that. So let's. And you can actually do that with this model I had here. This model in the uh, exam question, I just kept it at 50-50, exactly 50% 50 silver and copper. If you permit the ratio of silver and copper to vary, you simply add some more, a couple more, well, another term in there, you can end up reproducing this quite nicely. This is by the same simple model. We'll work the thing out if you want. Just have the copper, Copper silver ratio is not necessarily one to one. The overall copper silver ratio can vary from one to zero. And then work the whole thing out, and you'll find that you, with a very simple model of just the nearest neighbor pairs, you will end up with the, with the same sort of thing. So qualitatively, it's quite easy to predict it. I still find it. But it's not intuitively obvious that the long-range order disappears at a finite temperature. I mean, you just, you're so used to equilibrium constants and things don't reach complete disorder until you reach infinite temperature, but not in the case of the long-range order with more than one sub -lattice. Okay, now I'm going to go back, way back to the book chapter that we use at the beginning of the course with all the thermodynamics and phase diagrams, and I'm going to go back to section 10 of that uh, section 10 of that chapter, which is higher order transition. Um, okay, so all the transitions discussed in the book up till now were first order transitions. When a first order phase, okay, when a first order phase boundary is crossed, these are all the this is not this is second order, but all the phase boundaries in a regular phase diagram are first order transitions. When a first order phase boundary is crossed, a new phase appears with extensive properties which are con discontinuous with the other phase. The second phase that appears is not just slightly changing the first phase; it actually has different properties. Uh, an example of a transition which is not first order is the ferro to paramagnetic transition of iron, cobalt, nickel, and other ferromagnetic materials, uh, which contain unpaired electron spins. Below its Curie temperature, uh, iron is ferromagnetic since its spins tend to be aligned parallel to one another, uh, and this alignment occurs because it lowers the internal energy of the system. When the spins are aligned parallel, you have a lower energy than when they're anti-parallel. So at low temperatures, they tend to be lined up, and that's why you get a ferromagnetic material. As the temperature increases, the spins become more and more disaligned, misaligned, because uh, of the entropy effect. Until at a finite temperature, T. Curie, the endosorting is complete, and the material becomes paramagnetic. There is never a two-phase region. As you go from ferro to para, you don't have a region which has both in it. It's just in the goes from one to the other, and there's no abrupt change because it just becomes more and more and more disordered until you reach a point where it just becomes 100% disordered. Uh, okay, there's never a two-phase region, and no abrupt change occurs at T. Curie, which is simply the temperature at which the disordering becomes complete. Okay, so here's a vastly oversimplified model. This is the one-dimensional Ising model, which Ising predicted. Uh, so you have spins. It's very similar to what we did here. You have your spins either up or down. Spins can be up or they can be down. And you can talk about an energy between two neighboring spins. There's an, a an energy between an up-up between two spins which are aligned, which is favorable to the energy between spins which are misaligned. Okay, this is going to be almost exactly the same as the model we had here mathematically. So let the fraction of up and down spins be xi and 1 minus xi. And when two neighboring spins are aligned, there's a stabilizing internal energy epsilon. So we say that when they're uh, 
misaligned would just arbitrarily set that energy to be zero, but when there's aligned, you get an, an extra increment of energy epsilon. Okay? Assuming that the spins are randomly distributed, the probability of two upspins being aligned is xi squared, and of two downspins being aligned is one minus xi squared. So your, your Gibbs energy then is RT xi log xi plus one minus xi log one minus xi. The up and down spins are randomly distributed over the lattice sites, and this is the probability of two spins being parallel. This is the probability of two spins being parallel in the other direction, and that's the stabilization energy you get because of it. Okay. The equilibrium value of xi is that which minimizes g. You set dg to xi is zero, and you get this expression, which looks very much like the expression we had here. And what you're going to get then is you're going to get the same sort of. Um, you end up with the same sort of thing that if you then plot this thing, you plot. This is the uh, Gibbs energy of the system versus psi. Uh, okay, psi going from 0 to 1. Uh, at t is greater than t critical, you get a curve like that with a minimum of 50%, meaning half the spins are up and half the spins are down. And at t less than t critical, you get a curve like this, meaning that you have a two equivalent minimum points over here, which is ordered. And the lower the temperature, the more ordered it becomes. So at zero Kelvin, they're all lined up. And then as you heat the thing up, they start to become disaligned. And at a temperature T critical, they become 50-50. So it's an order-disorder transformation. And you can see that the mathematics works out almost exactly like the uh, mathematics for the uh, copper-silver thing. So at t is ke zero Kelvin, psi is zero, or equivalently psi is, psi is zero, or psi is one is the same thing. I mean, psi is zero, they're all up, psi is one, they're all down. So that is, the spins are completely aligned. Uh, okay, and if you do the second derivative here, you'll find that the, temp the temperature at which it goes from that to that is uh, t, t curies minus epsilon over r. Okay. So the higher, the stronger the value of epsilon, the stronger the ordering constant, the higher the temperature temperature, obviously. Epsilon has to be negative, or else you don't have it. As the spins become disordered with increasing temperature, energy is absorbed, thereby increasing the heat capacity. To misalign, Since the alignment energy is negative, as you disalign the spins, you have to supply energy to the system. Okay, so you're applying heat to the system. Uh, most of the disordering occurs over a fairly small range of temperature, just below T Curie. And in figure 8, I actually show then the um, figure 8, figure 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Okay, this is the enthalpy temperature curve for iron. Okay, so down here you're heating up iron. This is ferromagnetic down here. And you see, for this region here, the spins are almost all aligned. Okay, it doesn't, they don't start to become misaligned until several few degrees below T Curie. Kind of hard to see on this scale, but this is the Curie temperature here. If I were to magnify, let's say I'm magnifying this region here, what you're going to get is you're going to get more or less a straight line, then it kind of curves up like this, and this would be T Curie. So this is your H versus T Curie, magnified around that region. So along here, the spins are almost still all aligned, then the misalignment all starts to occur in the last 30, 40 degrees mainly and a T Curie, they become completely misaligned. So you, this is the heat capacity is going up because you're absorbing heat to misalign the spins when you reach this point here. And as I said yesterday or two days ago, it's the same thing with the silver copper thing. As you heat the silver copper up to the Curie temperature, up to the critical temperature of the last 30, 40 degrees, you start to get an increase in the heat capacity and then a second order transition occurs. So this is a second order transition. There's a change in slope but there's not a discontinuity. Okay, the first order transition, such as the melting point, is a change in H here, it's just a change in slope. Okay. In this extremely simple model, there's a discontinuity in the slope of Cp is the HdT at T Curie. If you actually work out that mathematics, you'll actually see there's an abrupt change in the slope. 
uh, such a transition when there's a discontinuity in the second derivative that gives energy or the first derivative is H, this is a second order transition. Uh, chapter 19 is the chapter in the physical metallurgy book that says compilation, but that's going to be printed. Uh, in reality, some ordering persists above T Curie, and this is short range ordering. Okay. And the transition is not exa also is not exactly second order uh, because there's long range forces between second and third and fourth. Transitions involving discontinuity in the third, fourth, etc. derivatives of G are called third order, fourth order, etc. transitions. This transition is almost, almost exactly second order, but no. There, no, I don't think there's arguments that no transition is ever exactly second order, but we can ignore that. Okay, let's look at the iron-nickel system in Figure 54. Uh, so, Figure 54. Should be near the end. 55. 54. All right. Here's your iron-nickel system. Okay, iron and nickel are both ferromagnetic. Iron BCC, alpha ferrite, is ferromagnetic. There's your Curie temperature. And as you start to add nickel to the BCC, you lower the Curie temperature a little bit. This is your second order phase transition line. Just like the one I showed you in the silver copper idea that as you add the nickel, the nickel does not favor ferromagnetism in the BCC phase, so it lowers the Curie temperature. It's constant across here, of course, because that's the Curie temperature for the BCC. Nickel itself is ferromagnetic in the FCC phase, which is this region up here. And this is the Curie temperature of nickel. And as you add iron, you actually increase the Curie temperature. And then the Curie temperature comes back down again. Why that should be the case, uh, I'm not quite sure if I could tell you right now, but it has to do, of course, with all the interactions between the various materials. I'm sure it can be modeled not too complicated a matter. Okay, let's put that back away. Okay, the Curie temperature varies with composition as it traverses the BCC phase, and okay, what I just said, at point P, the second order phase transition widens into a two phase miscibility gap, and the transition becomes first order. Point P is called a tri critical point. Okay, so let's look at that. What happens here is, this is a second order phase transition line. It's ferromagnetic or ordered beneath the line and it's paramagnetic or disordered above the line. At point P, it widens, it this joins into a two phase region. So point P looks like this. Okay, and here we have two phases. We have this, uh, this. okay, over here we have ordered or ferromagnetic and over here we have disordered and ferromagnetic. Here we have two phases, two phases, ordered plus disordered with a tie line between them in a normal two phase first, first order region. Above the, above the tricritical point the order disorder transformation is second order. As you go from ordered to disordered across here there's no discontinuity. As you cross it this way below the, uh, below the tricritical point the order to disorder transformation is a normal first order transformation with crossing a two phase region. Just like going liquid to solid, you cross a two phase region. Okay. And you observe tricritical points. There is some argument in the literature about whether this particular system actually has a tricritical point or not there, but it doesn't matter. For theoretically, let's say it does. So there's a tricritical point. I think it does. So most of the people seem to believe there is a tricritical point. Okay, so an order disorder transformation can be first order. Doesn't have to be second order. Right, let's go back then to the here. Okay, the magnetic transition, as I said, is an one example of an order disorder transformation. Another important type involves an ordering of the crystal structure, which I already talked about. The copper silver is the disordering of the crystal structure. Okay, now another example of that is the figure 55 is the aluminum iron uh, system. So here we have the aluminum iron system. One. Okay, so here you have an ordered and here you have a disordered phase. And this is your line like I showed on the diagram here. This line is if the liquid phase were not there, if you suppress the liquid phase, then this line here goes through a maximum at 50%, comes back down on the other side. It's exactly like the silver copper one I showed you. 
I showed you in the silver copper phase diagram. I don't have the silver copper phase diagram here, but in the silver copper phase diagram, going from silver to copper, as I said, you have a second order phase transition, disordered, ordered, with a maximum of 50%. Okay, that's what happens here. This is the same thing. It goes through a peak at 50%. But down the other side, it just doesn't get all the way because it melts first. Okay, so there's your ordered, disordered. Okay, and that's the same. That's the same thing. This structure, the body-centered cubic. This is the same thing as the silver-gold structure. The aluminum-iron structure is the same as the silver-gold. The disordered is called the A2 structure, is just a body-centered cubic, and the ordered structure is the B2 structure, which is the cesium chloride structure. Okay, with body-centered sites occupied by one atom and the, and the corner sites occupied by another atom. Okay, I showed that. Before you have a body-centered lattice. In a body-centered lattice, all the corner sites and the central site are all equivalent. So crystallographically, they all have eight pairs of neighbors, so that's your A2 phase. But then if the center site is preferentially occupied by aluminum and the corner sites are preferentially occupied by iron, then the symmetry changes and you have a, a B2 cesium chloride structure. So ordered. Two sublattices appear. In the ordered structure, you have two sublattices in the disordered structure. The two sublattices become equivalent, so you have effectively one sublattice. So that? But all the disordered tradition is only a joke in the CC. No, no, no. I'll show you another example. There are several ordered disordered transitions. This is just one. This is the A2B2. Order disorder transformation. Here we have in the next, going back to the previous figure, in the iron nickel system, this is an ordered structure here. This is a cube, this is a, a face centered ordered structure, L12 structure. Up here is a disordered face centered, and down here is the ordered face centered structure. And that happens to be a first order transition, as you can see. Um, what is the L12 order? This is the, the typical ordering in the face centered structure. In the face centered structure, okay, in a face centered unit cell, you have um, you have corner atoms, and then you have atoms at the center of every face. Okay, so you have atoms at the center of the faces. Okay. Atoms at the center of the faces. Okay. In the face-centered lab, cubic lattice, the center, f the corner sites and the face-centered sites are equivalent. They're identical. They have the same, the same uh, surroundings crystallographically. So if, the, if you're up here in the disordered region, the iron and the nickel are randomly distributed over all the face-centered sites, and you have a face-centered cubic single lattice. Below here, below in the ordered structure, remember in the face-centered lattice, the ratio of the face-centered sites to the corner sites is one to three. Okay, in a face-centered lattice, you have eight corner sites, but each corner site is shared by eight unit cells, so there's really one, one per. Okay, the corner lat, the corner sites here are say, but are shared by eight, lat eight unit cells, so there's one eighth of a corner site. Or there's eight divided by eight is one corner site per unit cell. There are six face-centered sites, each shared by two unit cells, so there's three per unit cell. Okay, so over here, the L12 structure, when it's completely ordered, could be written as FENI3. You see it's coming down to 75%. Okay, so at the ordered region, at 75% down here. And what's happening is simply the iron is on the corner sites and the nickel is on the face-centered sites. So that's the FENI3 L12 structure. Okay, now you could have the other side, you could have an Fe3Ni structure. And in some of these systems, so there's three ways that this could be ordering. You could have the L12 on either side, uh, Fe3Ni, Fe3Ni3, and you can also have a 50-50 structure in which, and I can't remember exactly, but I think it's alternate planes are occupied by iron, nickel, iron, nickel, iron, nickel. And in the gold copper system, you have all three. You'll have three order disorder, three ordered phases. An L12, an L21, I guess, and then the other one, I can't remember what it's called. So you get one at 70, 25, 50, and 75. Those are your, those are your three ordering 
structures and there are other ones. There's ordering in the hexagonal lattice too, and so this whole thing can become rather complicated. But here you have an order disorder transformation, and in this particular case, it happens to be first uh, first order. So I said the B2A2 transition uh, could terminate at a critical point like figure 54. Um, let's go back to... Okay, this, uh, this diagram here, this was your order disorder transformation. Probably, they haven't done the measurements, but this can go down to a tri-critical point as well. Okay, so this dotted line could come down like this and then into a tricritical point here in which you have disordered, ordered, and here you have a two-phase region. And so probably at lower temperatures there's a tricritical point here as well, but it's not clear from the experiments whether it exists or not. But I mean any order disorder line can split into a, and in which case it becomes first order. So in the particular case here, here you have an order disorder transformation which is second order somewhere and some region and it's first order and it's first order in other temperature regions. Here so far it's only second order but it could be first order. Uh, here, here you have an order disorder transformation that is always first order. You never have a second order phase. You always pass by a two phase region. Even if you take the pure 75% and you heat it, it transforms, it is not completely disordered when you reach 75%, so when you cross here, there's a discontinuity in the heat as the thing becomes. There is also some controversy as to whether or not many reported second order transition lines may actually be very narrow two phase regions, but this goes beyond what I'm going to talk about. Uh, although there is no, I said this before, although there is no long range order in the high temperature disordered structures, appreciable short range ordering still remains. For example, in the disordered A2 phase in the aluminum iron system, nearest number iron aluminum pairs are still preferred, even in the disordered region, but this is a short range order, this is not a long range order. And this, in principle, then persists all the way to infinity uh, temperature. <clears throat> now, the very simple model I showed here can qualitatively predict it, but if you're trying to quantitatively predict what's going on in the order-disorder transformation, the things become uh, much more complicated. First of all, you have to require, you definitely have to couple the short range and the long range order, okay, because the short range order is important order what range you are, what temperature range you are, which means if you're going to couple short and long range order, you've got to go beyond a pair model, you've got to at least go to some sort of a quadruplet model. Also, it seems that in these order-disorder transformations, the um, <coughs> these order-disorder transformations, the uh, uh, longer range forces are also important, second, third, and fourth nearest neighbor can't be sort of ignored in this. Uh, but the main problem, too, comes from, let's take this Fe on I3 here. Even if you try to do the L12 structure as a pair thing, the point is the pairs are different. The, the, between this and this is different than between the two centers. Uh, the interaction between a corner and a center and a face-centered site is different than the, diff than the interaction between two face-centered sites, for example, and the distance between two corner sites. And this is really important as to how these things distribute themselves, especially with something like FANI3 when you can have three types of disordering, which is really all the same material. If you take uh, the gold copper system, as I said in the gold copper system, you can have uh, uh, AU3CU, you can have CUAU3, and you can have a CUAU, which are different. This is all the corner sites occupied by copper and the gold on the face center. This is vice versa. These are alternate planes, and when you go up to the disordered region, it's just one big face-centered phase, so you've got to treat the whole thing as one phase. Just the way we treat miscibility gaps as one phase, even though it separates, is treated with, what, what I mean is one Gibbs energy expression. One Gibbs energy expression has to give, at high temperature, the entire, the disorder structure, but at lower temperatures has to give you three separate structures. 
Okay, and so you've got to take into account all the ways that these things can interact, and you can't just work on pairs. You have to talk about at least quadruplets of groups of four or five or ten atoms, because you have different geometrical ways of putting these things together. So you then end up with the um, the CVM, which is the cluster variation method, which I talked about earlier. CVM is the cluster variation method, which talks about clusters of atoms, and this is just well, okay, the, I talked about the quadruplet model and the, the quasi-chemical model. The quasi, uh, every model is a cluster variation method. The Bragg-Williams model is a cluster variation method of a point cluster variation method. That is, the clusters are just points. You, the quasi-chemical model in the pair approximation is a cluster variation method in the pair approximation. You talk about pairs, and what you're doing is you're distributing pairs over pair sites. The quadruplet model that I talked about, for the ionic systems, the one not as quite quasi chemical model, is one example of a quadruplet uh, cluster variation method in which the uh, in which the clusters are quadruplets. So then, remember what we did: we distributed the quadruplets over quadruplet sites, and then we took the next step down, was assuming that the pairs are randomly distributed, and then we went down. So you have three three levels. In the general cluster variation method, you can have several different kinds of clusters. You can have clusters which are octahedra, tetrahedra. They're distributed over octahedral and tetrahedral sites, taking into account how the, the geometry of the face-centered cell. And then you have different levels going back down to quadruplets, pairs. Okay, and it becomes mathematically extremely complicated. Uh, and <clears throat> they have used the cluster variation method. Um, if you want to read the cluster variation method, I can give you some texts if you can manage to work your way through the mathematics. And they claim they have used the cluster variation method to fit some of these, quantitatively fit the order-disorder transformations. I'm not sure I totally believe it. Uh, because, you know, that the entropy, the co configurational entropy expression in the, in the uh, pair model, in the modified quasi-chemical model, is complicated enough and has is only good when z equals two. Okay. Now, when you go to a cluster variation method, and they're putting tetrahedra and octahedra and moving these things all around, and they end up with an entire page of, of terms of the entropy expression, and it's really an approximation which is only good when z is two. And what does that mean? Uh, this is never mentioned. I don't know if I believe this stuff. But anyway, the point is for any practical aspect anyway even if it is all right it's got so many terms and so on that for any practical calculations you couldn't do it you end up with a huge number of end members because remember every in the quadruplet model every quadruplet is an end member if you have an octahedral model and tetrahedra then you got like 60 end members for a binary system or something Can you imagine trying to predict ternary and quaternary phase diagrams in a database when you'd have hundreds and thousands of end members it just becomes mathematically intractable there's a cluster site approximation due to Alan Oates, uh, which is a reduced version of the cluster variation method. Uh, it could actually be argued that my quadruplet model is a cluster site approximation because I don't explicitly take into account the geometry of the things. I just kind of mix them up. Uh, Jean Jean Philippe Harvey, his graduate student of Patrice's, has. Um, has programmed the cluster site approximation into FactSage, and they have some fits to the order disorder transformations in various metal phases, which seem to work okay. But again, they've got to put in quite a few adjustable parameters. I have just honestly have not studied this stuff enough to know whether this is just a bunch of curve fitting or whether there's something really to it. I'm not quite sure, but you can read about it yourself. I can give you the references if you're interested. Anything you will find in CalFAD or SGTE or ThermoCalc or whatever, and in the fact data, the FactSage database, uh, in which order disorder transformations have been treated, they are treated using the compound energy formalism, as we do the, the, the Bragg Williams approximation to the compound energy formalism, which is basically what you did in the exam question and what I did here on the iron nickel, with just a whole bunch of terms, okay, in order to make the thing fit, okay. You read the papers, they talk about the terms having meaning, I'm not sure. There's a whole bunch of terms you force the thing to fit, but I'm not sure that the terms have much physical significance. Okay, because remember, if you've got here, if you've got, this was simply your copper, silver, silver, copper thing, the thing we did for the, uh, um, the thing we did for the exam. I only considered the first nearest neighbor transitions, but you also have 
your L terms, you have your binary mixing terms along the sides here. You can put in a, an L1, 2, 3, 4 for a reciprocal term, just as you did in a, in a molten salt. So you can put in a whole lot of terms in the compound energy formalism and bend your lines around to get them to, to fit, which is essentially what is done. Okay, but I don't pretend to be an expert on the uh, order disorder transformation modeling, but I know that it's... Uh, so anyway, to do it with the, with the compound energy formalism in a simple model in order to predict the overall, you can predict the tricritical points too, they're easy to do with the compound energy formalism, you have to put in an L12 term here. Uh, but um, but that's not too terribly difficult, but in order to fit quant quantitatively to do an optimization with the order disorder then becomes very, very complex. So if you want to look into the cluster variation method and the cluster site approximation method, I wish you luck and I'll give you okay. But remember the main line thing is the cluster variation method, the huge entropy expression they've got is approximate. And you don't see that written up. It's approximate in the same way. But the modified quasi-chemical model is approximate. You've got to have z equals 2, or it's an approximation. But this is just approximation, more higher level approximation. Yeah. OK, that's most of what I want to say about uh, long-range ordering. I don't think you are going to be called upon, upon to model it yourself. And the long-range ordering can be important for physical properties of materials and so on. Obviously, if the thing's ordered, it's going to change your physical properties. The movement of dislocations are going to be changed if the things are... Do we have a, a order disorder model for transformation in glass? Uh, no, because it's a, it's a disorder phase, necessarily okay. a disorder phase. There's only one sublattice in the glass. Okay. You have order disorder transformations. The super, I mean, there are physicists have lots of these. You have your super uh, fluid transformation and lots of things down around liquid helium temperatures. You have a transformation from a super fluid to the other quantum mechanical things, but they are second order order disorder transformations. You have ordering, I would say, what ordering of the electrons and things. Become. You can have a, I think your superconducting transition is actually can be considered to be order disorder, but I wouldn't bet my life on that. I think it is the, the superconducting, non-superconducting transformation is an order disorder. It has to do with ordering of the way the electrons move around. But that's beyond. That. But I do believe these are second order phase changes. The glass transition isn't really, sometimes people say it's a second order phase transition, but it really isn't. It's over a temp. A, the glass transition is actually a temperature range at which the motion of the molecule becomes locked in, but it isn't a second, it's not, it's not an order disorder transformation. So it has to do with a, a locking in of the vibrational modes, and it occurs over a certain region. And I found out that recently a lot of the glass people, you see the, you know, the glass transition of this glass is 530 degrees. And what they define it is simply the point at which the viscosity passes something like 10 to the 15th pause. So I mean, it's not. There's nothing physical about it. It's just an arbitrary point at which the thing becomes so solid. We're going to start calling it a glass. But you do see, in a glass, you see if you cool silica down, if you were to plot the heat content versus temperature for SiO2, and you prevent crystallization. We don't have. It. It's hard to prevent it. It's hard to get it. Okay, that liquid. Here you've got a liquid. Here you pass the melting point, but nothing freezes. And it comes down, it just gets more and more viscous, but then there is a region in which it does tend to go down like this, and then it tends, tends to level off again. And what's happening is up here you get the, these vibrational modes, the way the things can vibrate suddenly become locked in, and over a fairly narrow temperature range, uh, the viscosity shoots up even more, and you end up with something that's more rigid, but it, it's not the same thing. And there's no, it's not an abrupt change in slope. It's in a little bit. You can approximate it as a second order transition if you want, but it isn't. Um, okay, there are just two other small subjects I wanted to talk about here, just for completeness, because you're probably going to come across them sometime. One was, uh, well, there was this ionic liquid model 
that's called the Stockholm model that's used by many other groups to model ionic liquids. And I talked about that two days ago in the um, two days ago when I was talking about uh, let's see when I was yeah. Okay, for the slide, I said that the way they uh, the ionic liquid model might treat uh, might treat a slag like calcium magnesium silica would be to have calcium and magnesium on these lattice and then to have O minus minus SiO4 two minus and neutral SiO2 groups on the second sub lattice. And this is kind of our in the basic region. If you're dealing with down here the SiO2 CaO. MgO, this region here, down below Fig2SiO4, Ca2SiO4, in this region down here, you really do pretty much have these four ions. This could then indicate the deviations from completeness, and up here, of course, you end up at this end with nothing on this sublattice and pure silica on this sublattice. And you can kind of fit stuff, but it's obviously kind of an uh, artificial model. Okay, so pure silica would be calcium and make the there's a, the number of lattice, the, the lattice sites disappear. The ratio of the lattice sites changes until when you get to silica, you have no lattice sites, no, no sublattice one sites, and everything in the sublattice two sites is occupied by silica. And you can kind of fit things, but it's not, I said the other day, not terribly predictive, but at least it's a way of going about things. If you wanted to look at the, the compound energy, or the ionic liquid model, uh, here this is number three, file number 39, how the ionic liquid model would be used for the magnesium bismuth system. Remember the magnesium bismuth system has, um, in your magnesium bismuth system, you have short range, this is the liquid phase, uh, you plot the uh, excess gives energy, whatever, you're going to get a sharp, very sharp minimum here, you have, what is it, Mg3Bi? What is it? Mg2 Bi, Mg3 Bi2. Yeah, Mg3 Bi2 is your ordered composition. Okay, you can treat this using a an associate model. In the associate model, you would have magnesium, bismuth, and Mg3 Bi2 all randomly mixing on one sublattice. The standard associate model, which you know why I don't like that. The um, the modified quasi-chemical model simply has magnesium and bismuth mixing, but with the uh, with Z uh, bismuth over Z magnesium uh, equals three over two, and then you do the quasi-chemical model, and the magnesium bismuth pairs are favored. Okay, the ionic liquid model, the way they treat it, uh, would be as you see the idea. You would treat it as two sublattices. Magnesium 2 plus goes on the first sublattice. First of all, you got to talk about it being ionic, even though it isn't really ionic, it's a metal. You put magnesium on this sublattice, you put bismuth 3 minus on this sublattice, you put charged vacancies on this sublattice, and you put neutral bismuth atoms on this sublattice. Okay, so when you're over at this side here, when you're at pure magnesium, then you have magnesium on this lattice and you have charge vacancies on this lattice. So pure, pure magnesium, pure magnesium metal is treated as Mg2 plus vacancy 2 minus. That's pure magnesium. All right. Pure magnesium, you've got magnesium here and vacancies here and the two charges are out. At Mg3Bi2, you have pretty close to magnesium on this lattice and magnesium 2 plus on one lattice and bismuth 3 minus on the other lattice. And pure bismuth, you have no first, the first lattice doesn't disappear but it has zero sites on it. And the second sub lattice is occupied by the neutral bismuth. And then you have to have an overall mole fraction, then you have to do a, a site balance with two variables x and y. Okay, so uh, your components are, or your components, let's call these the end members. The end members are, this is real magnesium. The other end member is magnesium zero, bismuth two, but there's no, actually no magnesium. 
And then the completely ordered solution is your third uh, end member. And then you can work out the site fractions on the different lattices in order that everything kind of balances out. And you get a Gibbs energy expression that looks like this, that has the three things mixing on the lattice, plus it has regular mixing terms for the interactions between them so that you can fiddle around and do some optimization. And, uh, you know, you can more or less fit the thing. To my mind, this is really artificial and an unnecessary complexity. But this kind of gives you an idea of how it's done. It's what it's trying to do is to try to treat, treat not to not use an associate model because of the obvious weaknesses of the associate model, but to still somehow try to fit the whole thing into a compound energy formalism without having to without having to explicitly treat short range ordering by a quasi chemical model or a cluster variation type thing. And I'm not very keen on it. Okay. So your short range order is really the concentration of this end member, if you like. Like you would have, when you work the thing out and at any particular point to minimize the Gibbs energy, you're going to get a concentration, concentrations of your three end members. And the concentration of this end member is like your, gives a, is the list, is the um, uh, sort of your short range order. Just as these are like the AB. In the quasi chemical model, these are like the AA, these are like the BB, and these are like the AB pairs. It sort of comes out like that. Okay. But you don't get the same entropy expression. And if you're gonna if you're gonna do that anyway, why not just use the quasi chemical model? But, okay. Anyway, that's the that's the ionic liquid model and then you, you can force things around. It actually the final equations you get are not too far from the quasi chemical model. And they can get reasonable approximations of the multi component solutions by using the ionic liquid model. It's a lot better than the associate model, that's for sure, because it sort of, sort of explicitly treats short range order, but not really. <laughs> okay. So if you come across that, this is the general idea. Now it doesn't have to be this way. You make up, of course, you make up your end members and so on in order to explain what you're trying to explain. In the silica system, the MMG calcium silica system, well, that's the way they did it there. You didn't need vacancies here, you need vacancies. All right, so that's the ionic liquid model. And the last thing I wanted to talk about was number 38, the limiting slope equation. This, I think, is something that this is useful. This comes back, this goes back to thermodynamics. Uh, Remember we talked about before the limit, this is your this is your phase diagram here. You have a limiting slope. This is your liquidus line, measured liquidus line, temperature versus composition. So A is the solvent. We're taking the limiting slope. This is the limiting the slope of the liquidus line at XA equals one. You take the tangent to the liquidus line at XA equals one, that's your limiting slope. And I'm assuming there's no solid solubility. Okay, so you've got a case in which there's no solid solubility here. And you're taking the limiting slope. Now remember what I said is the whole point here that the limiting the, the limiting slope was a useful thing. Remember we had examples in which you could, from the limiting slope, you could actually calculate the heat of fusion of the material, or you could determine if the limiting if there was solid solubility or not. And the whole point of the thing was that when you're in the limiting region, that the liquidus line in the liquidus equation depends upon the activity of the solid vent only. Okay. The log activity of A, which determines Remember, log activity of A in the solid liquid minus log activity in the solid is the heat of fusion over one liter T over. And when you're in the very at infinite dilution, the liquid, the solvent obeys Reynolds law. So the G excess doesn't come into it. You don't have to worry about the excess terms. It's just the ideal mixing term. Okay, so what you get is uh, we worked this out before. You get the limit, the limiting slope of dx dt. dx dt is simply the limiting slope is the heat of fusion over the temperature of fusion squared when you have a, a mixture of A and B. Just A and B are mixing. You can work the whole thing out. But what happens if you get, if you're limiting slope, I showed you before, if you have, uh, say you have sodium chloride and you add potassium chloride, you're just, the chlorine stay the same, you're adding potassium. So you're adding one foreign particle. So then you get a slope just like this. But if you add sodium chloride with K potassium bromide, you're adding two foreign particles, potassium and bromine, 
and now you get exactly twice the slope. You get twice the slope because the sodium is mixed with the potassiums, the chlorine bromines mixed with the chlorines on their sublattice, you got twice the entropy. Okay. And what, so what we do is we write this equation, I'll derive it for you in a couple of minutes, but this is the limiting slope, is the heat of fusion of A divided by the temper temperature of fusion squared times sigma nu, where sigma nu is the number of foreign particles, the number of new particles that are introduced by the solvent, by mole of solvent, of solute, sorry. The number of new foreign particles. And this is then, beyond this, is completely model independent. It's independent of all excess terms, of all excess gives energy terms, and it's independent of the model. So you might say, say I had sodium chloride and I add KBr. Well, then I'm adding two foreign particles. Okay, so I'll get, uh, so the sigma nu is equal to two. Let's say I put oxygen gas, O2, into liquid iron. The O2 gas dissociates to form two oxygen atoms, and so sigma nu will be two. Now the model's quite different. I mean, the potassium bromide to sodium chloride, you have two sublattices, the cations mix on their sublattice, okay? And the oxygen dissociating is simply the O2 dissociation to two oxygens with, which, mix with the, uh, uh, which mix with the iron, but it doesn't matter. You've still got two new particles, so your limiting slope is equal to two. So it's model independent, it's independent of the excess terms, it just tells you how many new independent particles are introduced by the uh, solvent, solute. But this is very important, you don't have to worry about, and this really, this is a very simple thing to measure. You, measure, you generally you have the heat of fusion, the melting point, you don't have solid solubility, you measure the, liquid, the limiting slope, it's going to tell you right away what kind of a model you have. If you took sodium chloride and KBr and you did this, you would find that this was equal to two. And right away that tells you that KB, K and BR are two independent particles. So it's a really good check on your phase diagram and first thing in your model. So let's, before I derive it, let's go through, um, okay, no, I am deriving it here, okay. <laughs> derive it first. And we're talking about a very dilute solution. In a very dilute solution, A is the solvent, B is the solute. You have NA moles of solvent, of solvent NB moles of solute. Uh, this is the number of A atoms, this is the number of B atoms. Uh, so NB moles of solute, we assume that it produces N1 moles of particles number one, these could be atoms, molecules, ions, N2 moles of particle number two, which are not already in the solvent. So if I had sodium chloride KBr, I'm getting, and I had a mole of KBr, I'm adding one mole of potassium ions and one mole of bromine ions, which are not already in the solvent. If I add, so if I start with sodium chloride and add KCl, I'm adding one mole of potassium ions, but I, the chlorine ions are already in the solvent, so they don't count. Okay, if I take O2 and I put it into iron, I'm putting in two moles of O particles. And so uh, So, example, the solvent silver nitrate, the solute's calcium chloride. Okay, so one mole of calcium chloride. Okay, we have uh, N1, one mole of calcium, so nu equals one, so we have one mole of calcium, which is not already there. We have two moles of chlorine ions, so the total number of uh, foreign particles is three. If we have silver chloride and we add calcium chloride, the chlorine's already there, so the total number of new ions is, uh, of new particles is one. Uh, sodium chloride and calcium chloride, uh, solid. Okay, when you put calcium chloride into sodium chloride solid, remember we, the calcium replaces the sodium, but you introduce a vacancy. And in the limiting case, the vacancy and the calcium ion are independent particles. Okay, so and one is you form calcium ions, calcium atoms, number two is vacancy, so the sigma nu is two. Assuming that they're not associated. If the calcium ion and the vacancy, because they have different charges, are associated and move around like one particle, then the limiting slope is. Okay, well, <coughs> once again, oxygen and molten iron, two foreign particles. Oxygen and water, it does not dissociate, so the number of foreign particles is one. Carbon, which dissolves interstitially in steel, it's not a substitutional solution, it's an interstitial solution, but it doesn't matter, news one, every carbon produces one 
doesn't matter what kind of a model you got. You can have interstitial, ionic, whatever. It's just the number of new particles, period. Okay, so it all depends on Henry's law, in which there's no interaction between the new particles which you're adding because they're so far away. So the enthalpy of the solution is simply the number of uh, A particles. This uh, it's, it's linear. This is the uh, enthalpy of the solute solvent and the entropy. The enthalpy of the solute is just the number of particles you add times the energy necessary to form them. And they're independent. Every time you add a new particle, you get the same, the same increment of H. That's Henry's law. And the same thing for the non-configurational entropy. I'll let you look at some of these things yourself, but this is the whole thing. The multiplicity, we're going to use the configurational energy as k log omega Boltzmann's equation. The multiplicity, okay, is simply the number of ways of placing the new particle in the solution. A very new particle in solution can be placed in beta i n a ways. Okay, so n a is the number, is the number of a particles. This is your solvent vent. So you have n a a particles. So you have Na lattice sites. You might have six Na interstitial sites. Okay, you might have uh, a second sublattice uh, in which you have three Na sublattice sites. But the number of sites in which you can put your new particle is going to be Na times some constant. Okay, so let's say that I'm adding carbon to iron. Let's say I'm adding nickel to iron. The nickel goes in substitutionally, so beta is going to be equal to one. Every nickel ion can go in is equal. The number of places to put a nickel ion is simply equal to the number of iron atoms that are there. Okay, if I put, say, carbon into iron, and let's say you have six interstitial sites uh, for every carbon atom, then beta is going to be six times that. So the number of places where you can put your carbon atom is six times the number of iron atoms. Okay, if you have a sublattice model, CaCl2, well, then the number of chlorine places you can put your bromine is twice the number chlorine atoms and so on. So the number of ways, the number of places you can, independent of the model, the number of places that you can put every new particle is equal to the number of particles of the solvent times some constant, which could be one, two, three, four, something like that, depending on exactly the model. What I'm trying to show is it's going to be independent of beta when you work the thing out. Okay, so this is your dilute solution, your multiplicity. Okay, we're putting in the particles one at a time. We're, now the number of ways, this is infinite dilution. The number of ways of putting in the, the number one particles, remember the different kinds of particles are called one, I is one, two, three, four, sodium, chlorine, whatever you're putting in. So this is the number of ways of putting in an I. Every I particle can go in in beta one NA way. Every number one particle can go in in beta one NA ways. And there are NI of them, uh, and one of them. The A direct num number two particle can go in in beta two NA ways, and there are N two of them, uh, and so on. So this is the number of ways of putting the one particles in, this is the way of putting the new two particles in, the new three particles in, and then the particles of course are all in, the one particles, two and three are independent, so you've got to divide by that. So you're, this is your infinite dilution multiplicity. In actual fact, this should be beta one Na times N times beta one Na minus one times beta one Na minus two times beta one Na minus three, but since it's very, there's an infinite dilution, you can just work the thing out that way. Your configurational entropy then is delta S configurational is k log omega. You work out Stirling's equation. Uh, you divide the whole thing to get the entropy expression. But here's the whole point. You take the configurational entropy of the solvent because that's all that matters. Remember in the limiting slope equation, the liquid to slope equation, it's the log activity of the solvent that uh, determines the that determines the liquid line. So when you take the partial of A and you run the thing over, what you find out is all the betas fall out. Okay, and when you take the limit as xa approaches 1, you get the configurational entropy of A, turns out to be r log of 1 minus xb times sigma nu. And that's all. I'll let you read the whole thing. All these betas, the betas will affect the, the partial property of the solute, but that's not what you care about. All you care about is the partial property of the solvent, which is basically obeying Rayleigh's law. Okay, and you work the whole thing out, your partial entropy is simply r log 1 minus xb times the number of new particles, which could be looked at as a corrected uh, uh, mole fraction of A. If sigma nu is 1, then 1 minus xb is simply the mole fraction of solvent A. This is, one minus, well, this is simply saying that xb is not really the mole fraction of B. The mole fraction, because you, you've if you're adding KBR to NaCl, you really are adding two moles every time you add a B. You're not adding one mole, you're adding two moles of something. 
Okay, if you're adding oxygen to O2 to iron, you're not adding one mole of oxygen, you're really adding two, two moles of oxygen ion. So this simply corrects that XB is the number as the number of B's as you've defined it, but sigma nu i is the number of particles that each B introduces that mix randomly. So you've got more. The bigger nu is, the more entropy you've got. So if this is a corrected mole fraction of A. But the main point is your Henry's law or Reult's law, which are the same thing, all the betas not come out, has nothing to do with the model, it simply is uh, XB. So then we use the limiting slope equation, mu minus mu naught is heat minus so on, and you put the whole thing in and you could end up with the limiting slope equation. So I've gone over it quickly, if you want to read it over yourself carefully, uh, I think you'll see what's going on. But this is really quite useful because it means that, this is very useful actually, you can just look at the limiting slopes of liquidus lines and you can find out right away what, uh, what you've got. And I showed you, well I gave you an example the other day, two days ago in the silica with the charge compensation effect. I've got the figure there somewhere. But we took the di diagram silica, Al2O3, Na2O, and then down here you have NaAlO2. Remember I said the sodium and aluminum come together, but to, the aluminum goes into the, occupies the silicon sites with the sodium staying next to it to compensate the charge, so it's really going in as a single particle. So then we looked along this line here, so if you treat the, this was SiO2 going to NaAlO2, this is the section along here versus temperature. We had a phase diagram that looked like that. You take the limiting slope here at this end, put it into that equation, and you get exactly a one particle slope indicating that the sodium and aluminum are going in together as one particle. They are not going in as two separate particles, they're going in as one, one particle. This is right up to the end. The sodium and aluminum stay associated. So you got, I mean, it's... Uh, then when we did it with boron, I showed you too the other day, this was boron, so you go to NaBO2, and here you can go all the way across. And here now there's a little bit of deviation from ideality in the whole system, but this is going right across here from SiO2 to NaBO2. Remember I said in the sodium borate system you got all these complicated borates and tetraborates and three and four coordination, but one might imagine that NaBO2, uh, NaBO2 could have the silica structure of Na and Ba. Again, if the boron goes into the silica network with the sodium beside it, and you really do get your limiting slope here and your limiting slope at the other end, are very close to one particle slopes. Not perfectly in this case, but it indicates that to a first approximation, that's what's going on. Over at this end, sodium and boron are replacing one silicon as a pair, which stays together. They do not go off independently. The sodium and boron stay together. So the boron occupies the silicon slight with the sodium compensating the charge. And on the other side, it kind of indicates a similar thing. I'm not quite sure why. More complicated, but you're still getting a one particle slope, pretty close to a one particle slope. So this one particle slope thing can be a very useful uh, concept that I showed you before. If you know the number of foreign particles, well then, if I know the number of foreign particles is one for sure, and then I, I find that I don't obey the limiting slope equation, well then it's probably because I have solid solubility, which will always raise the liquidus. Or I even showed you the other one, when you have a very high temperature fusion, you're sure about the number of particles and you're sure there's no solid solubility, but then the limiting slope will let you calculate the heat of fusion. So this is a really useful equation. It's all based on the fact that the liquidus equation at this end, mu minus mu to solid, RT log activity liquid minus RT log activity of solid, it only, only is the solvent the liquidus at the limiting does not care at all upon the partial property of the solute. It only depends upon the partial property of the solvent. And furthermore, Rayolt's law is obeyed. Okay, so uh, you don't need to worry about the excess terms. But Rayolt's law is only obeyed if you take into account the proper number of particles. So when people say uh, limiting uh, system at infinite dilution, infinitely rich system always obeys Rayolt's law for the solvent. It always obeys Rayolt's law as long as you properly account for the dissociation or association or whatever of your of your solute. 
Okay, so if you just treated it blindly, if you took, say, sodium chloride and KBr, and you said the activity of sodium chloride is a mole fraction of sodium chloride, well, it isn't. Okay, but if you assume that it's the mole fraction of sodium chloride, taking into account the fact that you've added so potassium and bromine are two new particles, then that's just that's, that's your sigma nu. You're correcting for the... Which really means that when you add KBr, you're not adding one mole, you're adding two moles. But then it obeys real law. When you're adding oxygen to iron, you're not adding one mole of O2, you're adding two moles of O. Once you correct that, and you take the mole fraction of iron based upon the iron plus two oxygens, then it obeys real law. So this is a very useful thing. Uh, if you want to go through the mathematics, that's fine. But if you don't want to go through the mathematics, then it's really very simple. That's it. That's your limiting slope. And there's your total number of foreign particles. Now remember, these are the new particles. If you add potassium chloride to sodium chloride, you got one new particle. The chlorine's not new, so it doesn't count. So I give you this because I think you can find it useful. For when you, whenever you look at a phase diagram, you should check the limiting slopes. You don't even need a computer to do it. <laughs> you just plug the thing in. See what your limiting slopes are coming out to what you expect they're going to be. There's so many phase diagrams in the literature that don't respect the limiting slope equation. You can use the limiting slope because you've got three things in here, really. You've got the heat of fusion, and you've got the uh, number of foreign particles, and you've got the solid solubility. Okay? So if you know two of those, if you know the heat of fusion and the, that, that there's no solid solubility, you can get the number of foreign particles. If you know the number of foreign particles and the heat of fusion, you can get an idea of how much solid solubility you've got. And if you know that there's no solid solubility and you know sigma nu, you can get the heat of fusion. And you don't need to know anything about the details of your model. You don't need to know if it's a sublattice model or a, a substitutional model or an interstitial model. Uh, all you have to know is the number of new particles that are going to. Okay. And that's where I wanted to end. Okay, thank you for your attention. Um, can I do the exam? Anybody going to do the exam? No, thank God I don't have to make one up then. <laughs> okay, so, yes. Um, about, the, um, about measuring the solid solubility, it's, it depends on the XP. How do you measure the solid solubility? Well, it's just the position of the solid that's the. Uh, Phase diagram XB, this is your temperature. Okay, there's your liquidus, liquid, solid, liquid plus solid. Yeah. Your limiting slope is the slope of this. This is assuming that this line is here. Mm -hmm. If this line is not here, what that does is it raises, it tends to raise the liquidus. Okay, so if you had no solid solubility, I could calculate my, my liquidus would be here if I have no solubility. If I introduce some solid solubility, and recalculate the liquidus, I get a higher, I get a higher limiting slope. Okay, so let's say you know, you have a simple solution, you've got AV, and you know that it's a substitutional solution of two metals, you know the heat of fusion, and the liquidus has been measured like this. This is your measured liquidus, so you calculate your limiting slope equation, knowing the heat of fusion, taking sigma nu to be one, and you get a liquidus that is higher, limiting slope that's higher, then you know that there must be some solid solubility. If you want to make a very rough approximation, let's just say this distance here is going to be about the same as that distance mm -hmm. there. It's not exact. I mean, there's no way you're going to exactly work it out. But it's, well, there is. If it was infinitely precise, then you could infinitely get it. Because again, even for that, you don't need to. Even in this limiting solid solution, only depends upon the activity of the solvent. If you know the number of foreign particles. And you've got a limiting slope here, and you know the heat diffusion. Uh, and you calculate, this is your experimental liquidus that you've got from the literature. You calculate the limiting slope, and the limiting slope is below. And you're sure that your heat diffusion is right, and you're sure that the number of foreign particles is correct. Then there's something wrong with the data. For sure there's something wrong with the data. The heat diffusion is wrong, or the liquidus has been wrong. Uh, also, I mean, okay, if the liquidus is below, that would indicate that sigma nu was great. If you calculate this for a number of foreign particles equals to one for a metal, you know it can't be greater than one, so there's no way that one mole of nickel is going to give you two moles of so. And always, solid solubility will always raise the liquid.
This also applies, of course, to phase transformations between two different phases you could have. This could be uh, alpha and beta. It's the same. This is the limiting slope of any transition. Okay, and then you transition, this is the... Uh, this is your limiting slope of your transition line, and this is the heat of transformation. It doesn't have to be a fusion, it could be any transformation. An equation which is very simple, but is not nearly used enough. Every time you analyze a phase diagram, just spend 10 minutes and work out the limiting slopes and see if everything is, uh, is reasonable. Question? Okay. Thank you. Been a good group.